So my name is Chandler Jordan and I am the program director of SC Economics. Um, the whole premise of SC Economics is to support teachers through workshops, webinars, resources, all of the things. Um, and it is my role to be that support system for you. We have a wonderful guest with us tonight who is one of our South Carolina Financial Literacy Master Teachers, Sabrina Williams. And she is gonna share with you one of her favorite views, one of her favorite practices, one of her favorite tools in her classroom, which is using children's literature. And I think the coolest thing about this is that using children's literature can be done as early as pre-K all the way up to I used it with my 12th graders. And so hopefully you guys will all get ideas, whether it's these specific resources that she shares or just ideas for other resources that you're aware of. We just hope that this will give you an idea of the cool things that can be done simply by bringing a children's book into your classroom, regardless of grade level. All right, Sabrina, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Chandler. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Sabrina Williams. I am an educator at Fairfield Central High School. I have, this is my eighth year there. So I actually started at Fairfield Central right out of college and have been there ever since. So I enjoy what I do. Uh, my favorite thing that I would say to teach is economics. Unfortunately, I didn't get to teach it this year, um, but I did start a club so that I could still, you know, use my economic concepts and get my fix, I guess you could say when it comes to economics. Um, but I do enjoy, you know, teaching economics. Uh, and, you know, some people think it's kind of weird that you have a high school teacher that's going to teach you about using children's literature in the classroom. Like, what do I know about children's literature, right? But, you know, as Chandler said, I actually went to an SC economic workshop about three years ago. And Chandler was the first to introduce me to using children's literature in the classroom. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go back and I'm going to see how this works. So I literally had movie day with my ninth graders and they all wanted to sit down in front of me. I'm sorry, y'all. Their Mom? daddy stepped out. Give me one second. Mom? We've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> no worries. Don't worry about it. We've all the been life. there. The life. <laughs> all right. Sorry about that, guys. Um so I said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to try this. I'm going to see how this works. Now, these, this, so this was me two years ago because my children are now in 11th grade and I have these kids again and they still talk about it. I sat them around me like they wanted to bring in popcorn and they literally just sat there with their legs crossed like we were in kindergarten on the carpets again. And they listened to me read the entire story to them. The first story I tried was on the Industrial Revolution. And I have that book that I'm actually going to share with you all tonight. And, you know, I really didn't even need to teach the Industrial Revolution after that, because once I read the children's story to them, it clicked. They automatically knew exactly what I was talking about. And that was just from reading a short little book to the students. Um, and then obviously children's literature is important to me. I have a whole library in my house. I have three small ones. Well, one's 11, but I still think he's small. And then my three and five year old who are right beside me doing homework right now. So, you know, I think it's really important that you get these economic concepts to children at an early age, because economics is an entire class when they're in 12th grade. Yes. But that's really too late. So if you teach high school, then you know, you probably have ninth and 10th graders who have a job. And so if we wait until 12th grade to teach them economic concepts, that's three years that they could have been, you know, saving up, understanding what it means to invest, understanding that when they get that first paycheck, that it's not going to be, you know, the 735 that they thought they were going to make an hour because taxes are going to be taken out. And I can't even name the amount of times that I've had high schoolers come to me completely upset because they were so excited they got this new job but they were highly disappointed when they got that first paycheck and realized the government takes taxes out. So, you know, it's extremely important that we start them at an early age, understanding these concepts so that when they are 17 and 18, it's not a foreign subject to them. They already know what to expect and they are aware of it and they can make savvy financial decisions and set them up for the future. So I'm gonna share my screen. And we're going to get started and hopefully my children will you know let me do this yeah calm down that's a good one he answered my own question i love it 
Okay, so let's see here. That doesn't make it. I'm smart because I'm five years old. That's right. Okay. And people are smart to get to see what you're doing and, and the answer. All righty. There we go. Sharing my screen now. Okay. Chandler, can you see my screen? Who's Chandler? Yes, ma'am. You're good. All right. Awesome. Dad, who's when I shared it, I lose y'all for some reason. I don't know. It's, I think it's the Chromebook. The Chromebook? All right, let's go ahead and get started. So our objective tonight is I can use children's literature to introduce economic and financial literacy concepts to my early scholars. So I'm going to break down different books per grade level, starting with kindergarten, and I'm going to go through sixth grade. However, all of these materials can be used at the high school, at the middle school, really at any level. Um, I've just aligned certain books with certain standards just so that you can see exactly how they can be implemented in your lesson plans and in your classroom. But like I said, please don't feel limited in that. If you teach seventh grade and you don't see a seventh grade book come up, please do not think that you can't use these books in your classroom because you can. Like I said, my ninth graders absolutely loved it. And I've heard Chandler's stories. Her 12th graders loved it as well. So please don't feel like you are limited to the grade level that I show you with the books. All right, so these are the standards that I've pulled out by grade level. Um, these are with the new college and career ready standards that were introduced for social studies, the 2019 standards. And I've pulled out each standard that um, coincides with the economic concept that each book um, teaches the students to just give you an idea of how these can be implemented in your lesson plans and how you can use them in your classroom. All right, let's start with a kindergarten book. Um, so the level is a very early level with this book. There's lots of pictures. The wording's bigger. Um, it's short to the point stories that's going to keep the kids interest. But it's called Betty Bunny Wants Everything by Michael Kaplan. And basically what this story is about is Betty Bunny and she literally wants everything. They go to the store and she wants to get everything, as you can see from her shopping cart. And so you read the story to the students and the economic concepts that this story really focuses on is four different things. So choice, scarcity, and then needs and wants. Um, so I've already I've put some guided reading questions on here, but I'm going to skip ahead for just a second and show you an activity that you could do with your students before you begin reading the book or after you read the book to really help them understand the choice, the scarcity, and the needs and wants. So what you can do is you can start off with two different things. So we have popcorn and pretzels here, but you could use anything. You could use chocolate and lollipops. You could use juice boxes and water, whatever works for you and your students. Um, you get, you know, your students best, so you know, what would work, but basically you bring these into the students and you tell them to pick one. So you say, okay, raise your hand if you would like popcorn and the children that raised their hand would get popcorn. Or you'd say, raise your hand if you'd like pretzels. So the children that raised their hand will give them pretzels. Then you say, raise your hand if you would like both. Well, when they raise their hand and say they want both, which, you know, they're kids, so you, you might have 75% of your students raise your hand, but there's not going to be enough for everybody to have both. And so when they see that, yes, I want it, but there, it's not there for me, you you've taught them scarcity just like that. Um, another thing is this teaches them a want versus a need. So I might want popcorn and pretzels, but at the same time, I don't need popcorn and pretzels if I'm hungry one thing is all I need. I might want both, but I only need one. I can live without the other. So you've taught them by doing this simple activity, needs and wants, as well as scarcity. And you've also taught them choice because they had to choose. Well, there's not enough for me to get both. So I either have to choose popcorn or I have to choose pretzels. So that is an activity that you can do with that book. Now I'm gonna go back to the book and we'll talk about some of the guided reading questions that I have posted here that you could use 
after you read the book with your students. So you could ask the students, what problem did Betty Bunny have? Even five-year-olds understand what a problem is. You know, what was wrong with Betty Bunny? They should be able to tell you, based on the story, what was wrong. And the problem, of course, was she wanted everything, but she couldn't have everything. All right, number two, why do you think her parents said she couldn't have all of the toys that she put in her cart? So now you're teaching them about choice. Yes, she wanted everything, but her parents could not get her everything. Uh, what do we call the problem when you can't have everything you want? And then that is where scarcity and the fact that you have to make a choice comes in. So that book at a kindergarten level is Betty Bunny Wants Everything. But if you are teaching the economic concepts of choice, scarcity, or needs and wants at any grade level, this book is a fantastic option. All right. At the first grade level, the book is called by Chris Butterworth, How Did That Get in My Lunchbox? The Story of Food. And so as you go through this book, the economic concepts that are going to be taught are needs and wants. Good. Serena, we are seeing the choice slide, not the next book. There we go. Can you see that chair for my mother? Yep, we're good. No, it should be. How did that get in my lunchbox? All right, go one more. There we go. That's it. Okay, it must have a. It must be delayed. Okay. That's okay. We got it. Awesome. Okay, so how did that get in my lunchbox? The story of food by Chris Butterworth. Our economic concepts here are going to be needs and wants, goods and services, producers, and consumers. Now, I really like this book because there's so many extension activities that you can do with it. Um, for example, you could actually set up, you know, a little shop in your classroom and you could give the kids Monopoly money, some type of money, and they can have they have to learn how to buy things. So they might want everything that you have to offer to them. But at the same time, if they only have $5 and to buy everything is going to cost $20, well, then they have to learn that you have to um, choose what do you need versus what do you want. Um, producer versus consumer. So they would become the consumer in that they would go around and buy things. Now, last year, I had to really start thinking about this because I had teachers say, well, you know, how would I do that? We don't want our kids touching everything for sanitary reasons or vice versa. The kids are virtual. How would we do this? Um, and so I came up with the idea that you could also do a virtual store. So, you know, a lot of times we shop online now. So it might not be a bad thing to start teaching the kids about shopping online. That is something that we do a lot with, you know, technology and the way that things are going right now. And so you might consider maybe doing a virtual um, shopping experience for your students. But the idea is to get them thinking about the goods and services, being a consumer, what's the difference between being a consumer versus being a producer, the one who supplies the food, as well as needs and wants. So as you're going through this story, some guided reading questions that could be used. Was it hard to make choices about how to spend your money? Besides food, what other items do families buy because they need them? What kinds of things do families buy because they want them? And where does money that families spend come from? So that teaches them that, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. Because, you know, my five-year-old, he lost a tooth yesterday. He seems to think that money is just going to fall from the clear blue sky because he lost a tooth. But he has to learn that, no, you know, money comes from certain places. It doesn't just show up. You have to earn your money. And so you could actually make that into an extension activity from the book as well. You could set up in your classroom a way that the kids could earn money in order to buy things. And I think we already do that and we might not really be intentionally doing that. But like if you do a sticker chart or something, the kids have to do something in order to earn the sticker. And so that sticker is showing them. And then, you know, once they get five or 10 stickers or however you have that set up in your classroom, then they receive a reward. And so you really are teaching economic concepts. If you think about it, you just have to find creative ways to blend it in. And by starting with a story that really helps the kids, it grabs their attention because they see the pictures you're reading to them. It gets them interested. They're engaged. So that's a great way to really engage your students, even at, 
five, six years old. Our second book, make sure that y'all can see it. Can they, can you see it Chandler? A Cheer for My Mother? Yes. Perfect. All right. All right, the next book is by Vera Will Williams and it's A Chair for My Mother. And this book has been used a lot in a lot of classrooms. Um, it's won many awards and it is just overall a great book. But the economic concepts in this book include human resources, income, savings, and savings goals. And so basically in this story, um, the child is um, at work with her mother and they are going through situations and the child is having to understand the difference between um, income and savings and work as well as physical versus mental work. And so this book really helps introduce those concepts to the students. And along with the guided reading questions, it can really help the students start to understand these economic concepts. So some guided reading questions for this book. In what way is the work that the girl does physical? In what way is the work that the girl does mental? In what way is the work that the mother does physical? And what way in the, is the work that the mother does mental? What does a little girl and her mother receive for their work? And so for their work, they would receive a salary. Hold on one second, y'all. Okay, back to sharing my screen. There we go. Donna, that's awesome. So Donna says that she used this book with her second grade class last year and they loved it. So hopefully awesome. she'll use it. She'll use it again and learn some more books tonight. So that's fantastic. That is awesome. Okay, for some reason it will not. I'm trying to share my video again and it will. It just keeps stopping on me. I'm going to try again. All right, can y'all see it? Yep, yeah, we can see it. Awesome. Here we go again. All right, so that's great. I'm glad that you are using this book. All right, our third grade book is a new coat for Anna. And our economic concepts that we could gather from this book include wants, scarcity, productive resources, and production. So um, our synopsis for this book is a set during World War II and a mother has to overcome the lack of money and find a way to make her daughter, Anna, a badly needed coat. So it's not that she wants the coat, she needs the coat. It's cold, they don't have a lot of money, it's during the war and a mother has to figure out how is she going to make a way for her daughter to get a coat. And so this book is great for teaching those concepts um, this book, I, it might be a little bit harder for the younger children, but I would say that this book is excellent, especially for, you know, third grade and up for middle school, as well as for high school. All right. Our fourth grade book is The Coolies. So in this book, and honestly, when I was looking at the fourth grade standards, there's not a lot of economic, you know, skill specific economic standards I would say but they're there you just kind of have to pull them out and so one of the things that I did find in the standards was this idea of a cost benefit analysis so basically we all know what a cost benefit analysis is but I will review just in case so a cost benefit analysis is in order to get something you know you have to give up what do you give up and what do you gain so what do you gain because you had to give up something so in this story, it's about Chinese immigrants coming to America to work in order to, you know, make a living for their family. So an example of a cost benefit analysis that can be gathered from this book. And I think the best way to set this up is to kind of make like a T chart and put cost on one side and benefit on the other. And just have students as you read through the book or after you read through the book, have them work by themselves, work with a partner, have them draw out what were the costs of these young Chinese immigrants coming to America and how did they benefit? So an example would be the cost was they had to leave their family in China to go to America. But 
on the upside, the benefit is they were able to make money to send back to their families in China. So that's just one example of a cost benefit that they could pull from this book. Some other guided reading questions that could take you through this book. Why did um, Shek and Wang leave China? How do you think that will affect the work the Chinese immigrants do? Why do you suppose the coolies were chosen to do the most dangerous jobs? So this really gets the kids to start thinking, um, having to use those brain cells and really think about what is going on in this book because unlike you know the first two books with the kindergarten and the first grade level, this book, you know, there's a lot of truth to it. There were Chinese immigrants that came to America to work who who did have to suffer here in America and you know had to do really hard jobs because there was there was it was a better life for them, but there was a cost and a benefit. They did have to give up things. They had to go away from their families. And so this really gets kids to start bringing in that historical perspective as well as those economic concepts that are so important for children to learn. All right, our fifth grade book is The Inventor's Secret, What Thomas Edison Told Henry Ford. So obviously this book is about Thomas Edison, the creator of the light bulb that we all know, and Henry Ford, the assembly line. Um, but the economic concepts in this book is producers versus consumers, because you know it's important to teach the kids that we can be produce producers as well as consumers. Cost and benefits, goods and services. So the overview, it just says the inventor's secret is a story of Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, two American innovators who became lifelong friends. Students learn about the products created by the two men and how consumers affected their production and price setting. Students also will learn how curiosity and determination led to innovation of ideas, goods and services that improve human quality of life. So this really gets the kids to start thinking critically of how how do we as consumers impact producers? How do we affect how they set their prices? How do we affect, you know, how do they hire and um, how they pay people? So this is this will get them really starting to think critically about all of those things that goes into, you know, bigger economic concepts that they'll learn more about when they do get in high school or at the college level. But this gets them that, you know, foundation that they're going to need at an early age to understand that idea at an older age. And then the last book that I pulled, um, it was is a sixth grade book. Now, this is the book that I actually read to my high schoolers. You wouldn't want to be a Victorian mill worker. So it's um, about a little boy who works in a British factory and it talks about, you know, just how grueling the work hours were how it made him feel having to get up at like 4 a.m. in the morning and work till 10 p.m. at night. And he barely got paid anything and he didn't get to go to school and how the work he was doing was dangerous, but he didn't have a choice because his family, they were poor and they needed money. And at the time, the only way for the family to get more money was to send, send their children to work in the factories. And so this book, the pictures are really detailed just looking at the pictures alone, the children can understand that factories were not an ideal situation for anybody, let alone for young children to be working in during this time. And so this really sets you up really for the Industrial Revolution, whether it be the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain or when it spread to America. Other economic concepts that you um, can gather from this book include capitalism, market economy, as well as laissez-faire, the idea that the government didn't step in at first when these children were working these grueling hours. And it's just the simple fact that you had children working that is even more crazy. And so the kids really start to understand that concept when they um, are read or read about this book. All right. Now, because we are in, you know, COVID pandemic, and I know that some some classes are still virtual, others are not, or you may have students who, you know, have IEPs that everything needs to be read to them, or they're, they're audio or visual learners, whatever the need may be. Maybe you want to assign this as a homework assignment or as an individual classwork assignment. I went and I was able to find all of the books except for the Victorian Mill Worker. 
but I was able to find all of the other books on audio through YouTube. So I included the links here and it might be hard for you to get them, you know, from this screen. But at the end, I have no problem putting mm -hmm. these links in the chat if that's something y'all are interested in. Or if you Google these books, it will pop up. Um, and Sabrina, I can share your presentation in my follow-up email if you're okay with that. And oh yeah, that's fine. Able to, yeah, then they'll be able to link right to them. Awesome. Yeah, because there's some other resources in this presentation that um, they could probably benefit from as well. So yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you, Chandler. Um, so other things that I had thought about, because when I first made this presentation, I was in a virtual world and completely virtual. So I was really thinking about how could everyone use it if you didn't have the students, you know, right in front of you, or even if they are right in front of you, if you like to use technology in your classrooms and your children benefit from that. Um, I put some virtual tips over here on the side. Excuse me. Uh, one of the ideas that I had is Edpuzzle actually has it now where you can upload YouTube videos. And then you can transcribe questions over them. And so I thought that might be a good idea if Edpuzzle is something that you use in your classroom and you're comfortable with uploading um, the YouTube video that's already provided for you. And then you just add the guided reading questions over the top. And that way you can ensure that the students are reading it first and foremost and that they're understanding the concepts. So it's kind of like, you know, a quick little assessment. You could also make a Kahoot or a quiz is about the book. And then I already told you about in the first grade, but the virtual shopping experience, if you were unable to do that activity face to face. Um, there's also some additional resources that if children using children's literature in the classroom is something that really interests you. And I highly recommend if you don't know if it will work with your students, just try it. What do you have to lose? But I think nine times out of the t nine, out, nine times out of 10, your kids are going to love it. I say go for it, try it. You never know. You really just never know. So if this is something that really interests you and, you know, got your wheels turning tonight, um, I would say that these additional resources are really helpful. So the first link links you to Econ Ed, and um, they have books listed that you can actually use in the classroom as well. More books than the, the ones that I gave you tonight as examples. There's also a link to a webinar on using children's literature to teach elementary uh, math and economics. That is great. So if you want additional information or if you want to see it in practice, I recommend this webinar. And then also the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has books listed as well as the concepts that those books teach that you can incorporate into your classroom as well. So these are just more resources for you to use in your classroom. Now, I will say, you don't have to go out and buy these books. Use your resources to your advantage. So I know like when I wanted to use children's literature in my classroom, of course we didn't have most of these books at the high school level in our library, but our librarian was so willing to work with me. She reached out to the elementary schools in our district to see if they had the books and they did. And so they sent them over to me and I was able to use them without ever having to spend a dime. I read the books to my students and then had them sent back over to the elementary schools. They were more than willing to provide those books as long as they had them. Um, one time, none of the elementary schools had them. And so I went to the county library and rented it with my um, library card. So don't think that you have to go out and buy these resources. You absolutely do not have to. There are plenty of resources out there, um, but you know, if buying them is something that you would want to do, um, maybe not these books, but I did look up these books on Amazon and most of these books are under $10. Um, so if, if you like to have a classroom library and just be able to, you know, put your hands on it, if you need it or when you think about it, then, you know, obviously that is an option, but I did just want to give you that resource to utilize what your district already has. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to put y'all into breakout rooms and we won't be in there long, maybe five, six minutes. Um, there's really no way for me to put you by grade level or anything like that. But when you get into your breakout rooms, I want you to think about a book that you already use in your classroom, or if you don't use literature in your classroom, maybe think about one of the books that we just talked about tonight, 
that can help you teach an economic concept. And so in your breakout rooms, I want you to share with each other the title of the book, um, the economic concepts in the book, and then an activity or two that you could do with your students. Um, an option, an optional task to this is with our new standards. Um, you could talk about if you know you're really been studying the new standards and you're like, oh yeah, I know this book and this standard would go great together. Share that in your breakout room. Share that with our community so that our community of learners, so that we all have this toolbox that we can use and build from and continue to build, um, build to as we continue on with introducing children's literature into our classroom. So I'm gonna escape out of here so that I can build our breakout rooms. But just to recap, when you get in your breakout room, about five to six minutes, maybe a little longer, I'll jump in and out and see how we're doing. But think of a book that you can use in your class, an economic concept that that book would address, and an activity that you could do with your students. And then when we come back, I'm gonna ask that each group have a speaker. And I'm gonna ask that you, you know, let us know what you've talked about. Give us a book, what concepts could be addressed and an activity that we could do with our students. So let me exit out. Of As she gets the breakout rooms together, I just dropped a link into the chat. One for federalreserveeducation.org, which has over 50 books available um, for you guys to use in your classrooms. You can sort those by audience, meaning what grade level. Um, and then also I dropped in a list that the Treasurer's, State Treasurer's Office created with the Future Scholar 529 plan, which actually lists out a whole bunch of other books um, that referenced directly from the Federal Reserve that are available for you to use too. So I dropped both of those links. Um, so the Federal Reserve, when you can kind of search on your own, but then you have the Future Scholar reading list file uh, or the summer reading flyer that kind of gives you a whole bunch of books that you may have never even thought about or knew about. Half of these I never even knew existed. <laughs> and so it gave me a whole list of, of books to look at and see where I can make them fit into my classroom. So I just wanted to go ahead and share that out with you guys um, because that might be a good starting place if you're unsure of what to talk about in your breakout room that just kind of gives you something to, to discuss. So, all right. Yes, I will absolutely send them in the follow up. All right, so I don't know what happened, but it will not give me the option to create breakout rooms. All right, I can do it. No big deal. Uh, do you have a suggested amount of, of how many in each room? How many do we have in here? Do we, we have, have 24. Um, let's do probably around five. That'll give about four to five people in each breakout room. That should be good. Perfect. We'll do it. When they're slow to come back, that means they're having good conversation. <laughs> That's great, though. So hopefully yeah. we'll have some great things shared out. Good. Nice. All right, let's. We got everybody back. Awesome. So, who would like to volunteer to share with us something that you discussed in your group? Some economic concepts, some books that you would like to, to use in your classroom, and some activities that can be used. Do we so have, we have any? five different groups? You want to be a little systematic about it? Maybe if you are in group one. So, spokesperson right. for group one. I can also call on you if you want it to be that kind of party. <laughs> I would like to nominate Mr. Kirkley, please. Thank you. <laughs> We All were in group right. two, so I'm still waiting on yeah, group one. So, you're, yeah. you're, so we had uh, Joyce was in group one, Shannon, um, Joanna, and Laurie. Awesome. Thank you. I think we got you frozen, my friend. 
I'll speak, Chandler. All right, there we go. We can hear you now. Perfect. Um, some of the we had a she had a really really great idea, and um, she worked with eighth graders, and she was talking about having her eighth graders write um a children book, um, to speak on personal finance. Um, another idea that we talked about was how we project how uh, we projected in um planet via YouTube or finding books where famous stars was reading those books and things like that. Um, one of my things were I'm working with my students on the problem solving process. So I felt like the first and the third book for me uh, would be a good one to use, um, and not only for finance and economics, but also for the first for the problem solving process. And so breaking down the problems in a discussion form, uh, using a problem solving process, arriving to a solution, or even just seeing reading the book from the problem to the solution, and then breaking it down using the problem solving process, and just how uh, can how just prompting their minds on how we can use the problem solving process even in our finances. That's awesome. That's awesome. Very good. All right, group two. I think Mr. Kirkley, you've been nominated. Yeah, I've been told. Um, but no, I enjoyed our group. We had a good discussion. I just messaged Stephanie because I didn't want to misquote the other book we talked about, but the one I had brought up that I had used um, in my classes and not necessarily had thought about using it from an economic standpoint was who moved my cheese and I had googled that real quick while y'all were talking about how I've used it for a while um, but never really thought about just using it from the economic standpoint so if you take a two second google and type in who moved my cheese economic lesson it pulls up plenty of websites plenty of activities all that kind of stuff um, that you can do so that's what I had that's awesome. No, thank you for sharing. All right, room three. Anybody want to share from room three before I just blindly call on someone? <laughs> we had Megan, Erica, Donna, Sharnice. I didn't know what group I was in. Yep, that's you, girl. Okay. Um, I. I talked about um, a book that I had discussed with you before about um, that where does my lunch come from? And then we talked about um, a chair for my mother. Um, and I've used that one with second grade and um, the where does my lunch come from with second grade. Perfect. Great. No, we love, I loved reading the chat during this whole thing and you were like, I use this book or either the, you know, my co-teacher down the hallway is using a book similar. So that was so cool to see. Um, room four, that was Kurt, Lou, Mary, and Melissa. I think Lou said uh, she wanted to do it, but uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. We talked about a bunch of good books and um, uh, a tearjerker that stands out is those shoes. I don't know if anybody uses that, but it's, um, I don't know, second or third third grade but my 12th grade seniors love it it's a it's a good hook to start a lesson on needs and wants and then follow up with a discussion or a lesson about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs I always have my students finish up creating their own illustrated version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, following up but it's a it's a cute little story the one that I rely on at the end of my first unit on um uh, basic concepts is the ox cart man goes to town and it's a really good uh, very short story illustrated book uh, everything you need for high school seniors but it's uh, you know it's a, a simple story about a, a man about 200 years ago who produces all kinds of things with his family throughout the year to take to the market and then when he gets there he sells them gets money, buys some other things, takes it home, and then starts the whole cycle over, harvesting, uh, getting down from the geese, uh, getting sap from the trees. And I ask my students all kinds of questions about uh, resources, different examples of different types of resources, unemployed resources, underemployed resources. And it's a really simple book that they apply uh, more difficult concepts to. So that, that's a good review for them. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Kurt. That is one of my favorite ones too. So great one to point out. All right. Room five was Jen, Catherine, uh, Patera, and Robert. Anybody want to share? 
Sure, I can go. Um, Thanks, Catherine. So we talked a little bit. Uh, we talked about the versatility of all the books. Um, we, the two of us in our group who were having a discussion, we talked about the elementary spectrum and then the high school spectrum and how each one of them could somehow apply, um, or most of them anyway, could somehow apply to both. Um, we talked about ways to kind of streamline that for high school and make it a little bit less, quote, kid-like um, whenever having the read-alouds. Um, I mentioned, like, for me in high school English, I could pair um, one of the children's books with an informational text as a hook to introduce the text. Um, but, yeah, we were just talking about the versatility and the need for economic education. So, Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Perfect. And if you are joining us for the South Carolina Finance Forum, I'm just going to do a little quick teaser right now. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a, a workshop session with children's literature books, um, different ones than we use tonight. And so we're going to do kind of an activity with four new books. So if you're coming on the finance forum, I'll share more information in the follow-up email. Um, but if you're coming for that and you want to learn more, my session will be spotlighting this. All right, Sabrina, you want to, you going to wrap us up? Yes, ma'am, I will. So um, it has been an absolute pleasure to get to present to you all tonight. I'm going to put my contact information in the chat um, just in case y'all, you want to reach out to me and maybe we can brainstorm some more books that you could use in your classroom. And I'd love to hear from you all. Um, I was excited to get to hear all these other books that y'all are already using in your classroom. So I'm learning just as much from you all as I presented to you all tonight. So I am extremely grateful for all of the feedback that you've all given me. And um, hopefully we can continue to grow and learn together and utilize children literature in the classroom. So thank you, Chandler. Thank you, SD Economics, for having me tonight. It's been a blast. Um, and I've enjoyed getting to interact with you all. But like I said, I'll be sure to put my contact information in the chat just in case anyone would like it or would like to reach out, um, I would be more than honored to speak with you. Perfect. And I am going to share with you guys the evaluation link. Uh, this link, of course, is what gets you credit for attending uh, this session tonight. The evaluation, if you do five or more uh, events with SC Economics this school year or this actually this semester, um, we are paying out an incentive of $100. So if you attend five webinars or you come to the finance forum and some other things um, in any any capacity five events with us um, we are issuing a hundred dollars so if you'll go ahead and make sure you fill out that i will also send a follow-up form uh, email actually probably tonight i'll go ahead and get it out to you all so that you have it um, and also because sabrina is a south carolina financial literacy master teacher if you use any of the books or resources or ideas that she talked about in this presentation in your classroom in regards specifically to financial literacy, uh, and you want to document that information by sharing out the lesson, um, the activities and pictures of the lesson, uh, you can earn an additional $100. And I will share all of that information in the follow-up as well. So opportunity to earn money from the SC Economics pot, opportunity to earn money from the from the master teacher pot so we like we like these honey pots coming at us right uh, any other questions do you guys have otherwise once you get the evaluation filled out we are good to go we appreciate you spending your lovely wednesday night with us but hopefully we'll give you plenty of time to get some dinner get some rest uh, and push through happy hump day right <laughs> so i will stick around just in case there are questions but other than that thank you so much for joining us Thank you, everyone.